Hello and welcome to this presentation of the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office's 2023 Speaker Series, Hidden Oklahoma. I'm Christina Wyckoff. I'm the historical archaeologist with the Oklahoma SHPO. And in this series, we've asked archaeologists working throughout the state to discuss important archaeological sites that they've investigated and to demonstrate why archaeology is critical to our understanding of our past. We invite you to visit okhistory.org slash SHPO slash webinars to register for future presentations, and you can view all of our recorded content on our YouTube channel at OK SHPO. Now it is my great privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ian Thompson. Dr. Thompson is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Senior Director of Historic Preservation and Museums at the Choctaw Nation. His presentation is Out of the Earth, Revitalizing Choctaw Traditional Art. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Yukoki, Christina. So I'll go ahead and get started here. Lito, Sohof Chefoyeti, and Thompson. Chapter Amateur Naholo Sia Sitik Chiemi Ilti Tokloka Antlers Oklahoma Bilinka Ilashwa Atako Oklahoma Chata Okla Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Tokselali. Hello, my name's Ian Thompson. I'm Choctaw and Euro American. I live with my wife Amy near the town of Antlers, Oklahoma, and I serve as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. What I'm presenting about today is something that's near and dear to my heart, revitalizing Choctaw traditional art. So I'd like to thank Christina and the OK Shippo for giving me the opportunity to share this with you all. For those who may not know, the Choctaw homeland is located in the southeastern United States, more specifically west central and southwestern Alabama, east central and southeastern Mississippi. What I'm sharing on the screen here is a view of the Choctaw homeland from Choctaw eyes. This is about 300 years ago. The main Choctaw villages are in black at the center of the screen. The blue areas are Choctaw hunting territories. The colored bands are different named ecozones in the Choctaw homeland. They, they have names in the Choctaw language as well. So you start out with the Gulf Coast there, and then that dark green band is the longleaf pine forest. The lighter green band is mixed hardwood forest, and the tan colored bands are tall grass prairie. Each of these have importance in Choctaw traditional culture. There's a Choctaw oral history that I'll get into a little bit later in the presentation. And it talks about interacting with Pleistocene megafauna in the Choctaw homeland. From archeology, span we know that in that area, the megafauna went extinct at least 11,000 years ago. So that means that at least a, a core group of Choctaw ancestors were living in the homeland at that time. And by extension, about 600 generations of Choctaw people and ancestors have lived their lives within the homeland that I just showed you. There's there's something really special about that. So, you know, you can think about this particular group of people living there for that long. That's a unique chapter in human history. There's never going to be another group of people as long as humans exist that's going to have that same 11,000 plus year experience with that particular part of land that's the Choctaw homeland. And the cumulative result of that experience is Choctaw culture. Colonization is not the topic of my presentation today, but suffice it to say that with the arrival of colonial powers from other parts of the world, diseases were introduced that native people had very little immunity to. Uh, before European contact, there was very little communicable diseases in the Western hemisphere. And so when these diseases hit, they were devastating. It's estimated that between 70 and 90% of the Native people who were living in the Americas in 1400 passed away shortly after European contact. With that, it created power vacuums. And so there were all of these cascading events and conflicts that happened radiating out from, col radiating out from colonies. And ultimately, this weakened indigenous communities, indigenous tribes. This led to land dispossession. On this graphic, you see different shaded areas and each color represents a different land session treaty that Choctaw people signed with the United States. On the left, those are lands that were received in return through treaty. 
this ultimately set up the Trail of Tears, you know, a removal of Southeastern tribes from their homelands into present day Oklahoma. And the Choctaw were the first Southeastern tribe to face this removal. Uh, we gave it the name Trail of Tears. We were also the last tribe on the removal. The last Choctaw Trail of Tears was in 1902, 1903. And you can see some of the roots here. This is something that was faced by a number of other tribes too. For Choctaws, not everybody left the homeland, but even those that were able to stay in the homeland were disconnected from having the ability to manage the land. A lot of people realize what land dispossession means. Um, some people understand the, the population decline that happened as a result of colonization. A lot fewer people understand the ecological implications of Native American tribes being removed from their homelands. So I, I'm going to demonstrate that here visually a little bit. This image is of Olsi. He's a Choctaw man in a longleaf pine forest. And this was represented by that dark green band that we saw on the map of the Choctaw homeland earlier. This is old growth forest. It's 90 feet to the first branch in these trees. And yet if you look back behind him, you can see that there's sunlight hitting the ground. So it's an open canopy forest represents incredibly high ecological diversity, and it was managed this way intentionally. When the land was taken out of Choctaw management, this is what happened to it. There are accounts from the time period that talk about the massive erosion that happened across Choctaw country just a few years after the Trail of Tears started. And you can see this in modern pollen diagrams too from the area in the form of ragweed and other disturbance species equated with the time period of the mid 1800s, right after the Trail of Tears. Most Choctaw people immigrated to present day Oklahoma, Indian territory. This was the homeland, the, the part that Choctaws moved into was the homeland of the Caddo and the Quapaw and some other tribes. It wasn't the Choctaw homeland, but it was land that had been sustainably managed for thousands of years, much like the Choctaw homeland. However, it, after some time in Oklahoma, Ultimately, Choctaws were persuaded to sign agreements with the federal government that ultimately led to the individual allotment of tribal lands. So what had formerly been communal land holdings in Oklahoma belonging to tribes as a whole were divided and allotted to specific individuals. And with this, the federal government encouraged that the tribal folks who own those land allotments should rent them out to sharecroppers. So this is an image of sharecropping here in the Choctaw Reservation. In the 1920s, um, Choctaw Nation actually had the highest incidence of sharecropping in the entire United States. And the folks that came in were pretty destitute. You know, they, they weren't rich. So they came and made the best living that they could from the land. However, in doing so, they didn't really think about sustainability. So they created another massive erosional issue. There are accounts from the time period from Choctaw people about specific parcels of land where the soils used to be fertile enough to grow cotton. And within a few years of sharecropping, they barely grew grass like what you see here. So we've talked about the population decline. We've talked about removal from the land. We've talked about you know a couple of ecological disasters that have happened. Colonization also meant a concerted effort to destroy Choctaw language, traditional knowledge and identity. This had been through boarding schools and other means. Despite all of these challenges, the Choctaw Nation has survived, along with almost 600 other Native American tribes in the United States. The Choctaw Nation is housed in southeastern Oklahoma. Uh, we have over 200,000 tribal citizens. We're the third largest tribe in the country. And the tide has turned in a lot of ways. The tribe is rebuilding on many different fronts. One of these is we have a historic preservation department. Um, the National Historic Preservation Act sets up basic protocols to tribes to set up their own tribal historic preservation offices. We work closely with the state. Our particular office has taken on a number of duties through the National Historic Preservation Act and also duties that our community identifies are important to them for us to fulfill. So we're made up of eight different programs. You see that on the left column there, the different programs that are part of the Choctaw Nation Historic Preservation Department. Every four years, we do a preservation plan. And as a part of that, we reach out to the Choctaw community and we ask, what would you guys like us to be doing that we're not currently doing to, to serve you better when it comes to historic preservation? 
these are the responses from the last survey. Um, the top two responses, and, and these aren't things that they check, these are things that they write in. So the top two responses are actually things that our department doesn't cover directly. However, if you look at the, the blue lines there, the top one is preservation, followed by Choctaw history and daily life before the Trail of Tears, followed by Choctaw history, followed by the Trail of Tears, followed by crafts and traditional arts. So four out of our top five directives from the community are to focus on Choctaw traditional culture and traditional arts in the homeland when we live the fully indigenous life. There's a lot of value to this as the tribe faced a, a number of things to destroy traditional culture. Many parts of it survived, it was very strong. And we found that those parts, when they're re-implemented, they tend to help community members to overcome a number of the obstacles that, that they may face otherwise. You know, things like diabetes, things like not having purpose. We find that a lot of folks, when they return to different aspects of traditional culture, it makes a big improvement in quality of life. And this is ultimately because Choctaw traditional culture comes from those 600 generations of experience that I was talking about earlier. It's not exactly the same as Western society, but it is a viable alternative in many cases. And in many cases, it can provide ideas that are independent and different and work. And a lot of that has applicability today. So obviously the topic for today is archeology. span um, Archeology span has a, a checkered past with Native American communities. But for the past 40 years, uh, indigenous archaeology is a school of thought that's developed within the discipline. Indigenous archaeology is archaeology with, for, and by indigenous people. So it's a, a partnership, it's a collaboration, it's tribal communities creating their own archaeology programs like Choctaw Nation and a number of others have. And through this, you know, one aspect of it is legal compliance. You know, we're, we're responsible to comply with the National Historic Preservation Act, which is great. But there are other opportunities too. And one of those is to use tribal directed archeology span through means that can help to reawaken certain aspects of culture that are sleeping as a result of colonization. So our office works to do this on a regular basis. Um, it's something that I've been passionate about since I, I was a kid. So I'm gonna share some of these stories with you. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just a little bit of what's actually gone on. I'm gonna start at the beginning. I mentioned earlier about a Choctaw oral tradition involving the Pleistocene megafauna. This tradition says that at an early time when Choctaws were in the homeland, there were herds of giant animals that traveled together and they ate off the lower branches of the trees and they girdled the bark on the trees and they killed them. And this is ultimately what created the Black Belt Prairie. There's actually a name in the Choctaw language for the woolly mammoth. It's non ishtaholo which means something that makes holy. So Choctaw people considered those giant animals to be sacred. That's preserved through the language itself. Eventually, these animals went extinct, and that's recorded in Choctaw oral tradition too. It says that it happened as a result of disease. And one of the traditions even talks about the last animal that was still living on its own after the rest of its group had died. Indications from the Choctaw homeland, in addition to this oral story, come through archeology span of the interaction between people and these animals. These tend to take the form of spear points. Um, the soils in our homeland are pretty acidic, but stone is one thing that does preserve. These are two Clovis points that are from right there in the Choctaw homeland. They're both made out of something called Tallahatta quartzite, a particular type of rock that's from that area. Chipping stone arrowheads, flint napping, um, has been a gateway for me into culture and archaeology both. When I was seven years old, my uncle started me chipping arrowheads and I just caught that passion for learning traditional culture. So I would seek out teachers and spend a lot of time on my own growing up trying to learn traditional skills. This image here is a, a stack of Clovis points. On the left, that's a Clovis point from near the Choctaw homeland that broke as it was being fluted. It's made from Fort Payne shirt. The other three Clovis points are ones that I made a few years ago. Superficially, mine look like the old one, but if you look back at these old ones, they have a, a really characteristic flaking pattern. Um, the edges have these flake scars, large flake scars that cross all the way across the point. They don't have a lot of small chips along the edges, and yet the edges are very sharp just with those large flake removals. There are thousands of people that chip arrowheads today called flint nappers, and probably 90% of flint nappers use copper tools. That's not necessarily helpful for understanding how people chipped stone back in the Pleistocene. Most academic flint nappers 
use tools like this. This is a, a billet made out of a moose antler shaft. And basically you, you grind that off like you see here. And then you use that to hit the edge of a stone blank to drive off a long flake. But using that technology, you know, at least I have never been able to replicate the flaking pattern on Clovis. So here, not that long ago, there's an individual in the, the flint knapping community. He's not academic, but he's really interested in the traditional tools that people actually use to make these points in the past. And he came up with this setup that you see here. And it's beautiful in its simplicity. It's an indirect horizontal punch. Basically, you take a deer antler, which is the, the white thing that you see at the upper right there. You grind it off round at the skull cap. You cut off the tines, and then you attach that to a shaft. It's basically like an arrow shaft. You can tie it on, or in this case, I drilled out the bottom of the, the antler, and it makes a socket that this wooden shaft fits into. The way that you use this horizontal punch is you slide the shaft of the, the wood underneath your right knee, and then you position the antler against the edge of the piece of stone that you want to work. So it's incredibly accurate. You're not swinging this, this billet at a small platform on the edge of the stone. Uh, if you're using hard stone, like this Tallahatta Quartzite here, you have to swing with a lot of force and it's really hard to hit with the 16th of an inch precision that's required to strike off a flake in the way you want. Instead, with this horizontal punch, you just set it against the edge of the stone and then you can hit it with a large club. So besides being accurate, this also concentrates the force. You're having that small contact from a small deer antler but is transmitting the force of a large club hitting the stone. So let's see how this works. This is a, a blank made from Tallahatta quartzite from the Choctaw homeland, the same material that those spear points, Clovis spear points were made from that I showed you earlier. Tallahatta is an interesting material. It's really, really tough. It's made from these small sand grains that are fused in a silicious matrix, but the sand grains still persist. So when you knock off a chip, the sand grains almost act like pottery temper. They diffuse a lot of the energy that's going in it to knock off the chip. So you have to use something that can transfer a tremendous amount of force to the stone to knock off large chips. Talahata gets its name from the Choctaw word for this stone. In Choctaw, it's called Talihata. It means silver stone. Uh, to my knowledge, that's one of the few instances where modern geology uses the same name for a type of stone as the indigenous people who knew that stone for thousands of years before. So this blank here, it's what you take out of a quarry. It's just chipped with a hammer stone. This is the first round of flaking with the horizontal punch that I showed you earlier. And you can see it, it drives flakes right across the stone, the whole surface, even though this is really tough stone. So this looks like the Clovis blanks that you find in the Choctaw homeland and, and really over a, a large portion of the United States. This is the second round of flaking, still using the horizontal punch. The picture at the left here, the point preform has been shaped, and then a deer antler tine has been used to shape a, a fluting platform to drive off a large flake from the base of the preform. The middle picture is the preform with the first flute removed. The picture on the right has the second flute removed. Um, pieces like this you find in the archeological record. Uh, experimentally, they're really useful as knife blades, but if we're trying to duplicate the type of Clovis points that I showed you earlier from the Choctaw homeland, it takes another step a little bit finer flaking. This is done really simply. Um, if you have a, a socketed horizontal punch, you can just remove the antler that I showed you earlier and instead slide on an antler that looks like the one in this picture. This is just an antler tine with a, a small hole drilled in the end. And you use the punch the same way, but now it concentrates the force in a much smaller area just on the tip of that antler. And the end result is this. This is a finished Clovis point made out of the Tallahatta blank that I showed you earlier. And it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look closely, you can see that the finishing flakes travel all the way across that blade. You know, they start at the edge, they bend up over the top of the blade, and then they terminate towards the opposite edge. So from the, the previous image that I showed you, um, this would work as a knife, and then you use the antler tine punch tool, you cover it in flakes again, then it gets thin with even sharper edges, and then you can finish it with pressure. So to me, this is recovering potentially a, a small part of really deep Choctaw history and potentially history for other Native American groups. Don't know for sure that they used a horizontal punch, but it sure is easy and efficient to carry around. It's very lightweight. And then the flaking scars very closely resemble what you see on the original Clovis points, those big bold flakes 
that go from one edge to the other, representing the power that the punch has. Clovis points were just the first, or maybe not even the first, in a, a series of stone points that were made in the Choctaw homeland. This is a, a Dalton point. This type was made in the Choctaw homeland beginning about 12,000 years ago. Uh, it was used across a wide swath of the central and eastern United States. It developed from Clovis. It still has flutes like a Clovis, but instead of having those big, broad percussion flutes, the whole point is covered in pressure. And this can be done with uh, another tool. This right here, it's just a deer antler put onto a long handle that where you can use leverage and use your legs to take off those long pressure flakes that go all the way across the point. Talahat is beautiful stone. This is the same point backlit. It's translucent, beautiful Eocene sand that's been fused together. These are some more paleo points from the Choctaw homeland, recently made, of course. The left is another Dalton. The right is a San Patrice. You can see they're both fluted like the Clovis. And then, of course, flint napping technology continued to change in the Choctaw homeland and elsewhere. These are some middle and late archaic points. So learning this is fun. It's certainly personally fulfilling. But, uh, you know, what does it really mean? What value does it have? Well, one of the things for archaeology is making it relevant. And if you're talking about past phases, if you're talking about all of these concepts that aren't really human, then, you know, it's questionable how much value that has beyond the archeologist. But if you're talking about the heritage of living people, and if you're talking about working with the community or a community itself, working with archeology, span to use the tools that archeology span has to revitalize sleeping parts of culture, then suddenly it has a meaning for a whole lot wider group of people. This is an image of a flint napping class for Choctaw Nation. You know, every year at the annual Labor Day Festival, we give demonstrations and basic teaching to about 500 people that come through, you know, 500 people leave with an arrowhead that they've made every year. And we teach flint napping at culture classes and camps throughout the year too. So hundreds of people get to benefit from this knowledge. We don't teach them how to make Clovis points at the first meeting, but, uh, you know, over time they can work to that level of traditional skill if they would like to. So let's, let's take the project a little bit farther in time. Um, I know an elder who knew an elder who knew an elder that remembered chipping stone arrow points in the Choctaw homeland. And arrow points, of course, go with a completely different technology than the air, than the atlatl, you know, than the Clovis point, which goes on an atlatl. They go with the bow and arrow pictured here. So we're going to go to the north part of Choctaw country now, to the Lubbock Creek site. This is in Pickens County, Alabama, on the Tom Bigby River. It's a site that was inhabited from Clovis times, actually, periodically but uh, it was inhabited continuously from the late woodland up until the 1600s or so. So it's a great place to, to learn about the archeology span of indigenous Choctaw culture for the last thousand years or so. These are stone arrow points from the Lubbock Creek site. They're, not, they're from non-funerary contexts. Everything that I'm gonna show you, all the artifacts that I'm gonna show you today are from non-funerary contexts. These are made out of a different stone. It's called Tuscaloosa Chert. Its name's Tasanok in the Choctaw language comes in the form of tan cobbles, which you see at the right there, found in the sandbars of the Tom Bigby River. The points, as you may remember, were red. This indicates that they were heat treated. Heat treating changes the stone. Um, in the case of Tuscaloosa Chert, it makes it red. That red color is really important culturally for items that are gonna be used for hunting or for war. It also makes the stone easier to chip. It makes it more glass-like, which is really handy for those small points. The series of images at the top show the traditional process for heat treating Tuscaloosa chert. You dig a small pit in the ground, you build a fire of hardwood, let it burn down to coals, you cover that in dry sand, you take the pieces that you want to heat treat, which hopefully have been sitting inside out of the rain for a month or so, put those in the pit, cover it with more sand, build a fire on top, and then let it burn down and cool over the period of a couple of days. And the results are what you see here. At the bottom there, that's a cobble of Tuscaloosa chert, and it had a flake driven off before it was heat treated. And then the remainder of the cobble was heat treated and they're put back together. So you can see the color change here. Chipping an arrow point is a lot less demanding than chipping a Clovis point. Um, these simple tools here can be used. They have some correlates that are found at the Lubbock Creek site and a lot of correlates found archeologically elsewhere for flint napping tools. At the right, that shows flat and side views of the progression from a heat-treated cobble to a finished Madison point. 
So there's a handful of traditional Choctaw arrow points made from stone from the Choctaw homeland. And that's cool, but there's a lot more to it than that. You know, that's just one tiny part of a weapons component that happens to be represented archaeologically. What about the other parts of that weapon system? Well, we have some materials that are were collected or given from Choctaw people to Euro-Americans in the past, and then ultimately they ended up in ethnographic collections. This is an example here. These are the oldest Choctaw arrows that we know of. Uh, they date back to the early 1800s. And these particular arrows have antler points that has correlates earlier in time. If you look at the bottom image there, those are similar antler points from the Lubbock Creek site from pre-contact archaeological contexts. There are two Choctaw words for arrow. One is oskinaki, which means cane projectile. One is itinaki, which means wooden projectile. So for this example, I'm going to start with oski, river cane. You take the cane and break off the small branches. You heat it over some coals, and that makes the cane limber, and you can straighten it out. And then when it cools, it will keep that straight shape. So the cane at the top is the same as the cane at the bottom. That's the same piece of cane. It's just been straightened. At the Lubbock Creek site and elsewhere, you find sandstone pieces with grooves in it. And those grooves, some of them have cross sections that are rounded. So it looks like a wooden shaft was drawn through there. Modern correlates on the right there, you can take two pieces of sandstone and take an arrow and slide it back and forth in there and twist it. Um, that will smooth out the nodes of the cane. This particular arrow shaft here is wood. That will make it just perfectly even diameter. On the left, that's one method to score and snap a knock in an arrow to inset a point. On the right, that's a copper point. It's copper, but it was made entirely with stone tools, and it's being set into the tip of an arrow with deer tendon dipped in high glue. We'll get to that in a little bit. These are different styles of traditional Choctaw arrow points found archaeologically, and also points that were still being made by our community into relatively recent times. Not so much the stone points, but some of the fishing points and the sharpened cane points and the blunt points were, were still used by Choctaws here quite recently. Two different processes for preparing arrows to make, for preparing turkey feathers to make arrow fletchings. Um, turkey feathers are what was used on that early group of Choctaw arrows I showed you. Experimentally, turkey wings are the strongest feathers you can have. You know, at least functionally speaking, they're better than raptor feathers for that reason. So we've got the old arrows at the top. We've got modern made arrows here at the bottom. And the paint job is different. Um, we don't directly copy ancestral designs, but the arrows are, other than the paint designs, identical. Same materials, same size, same function. An arrow by itself can only sit on a shelf. That's not very useful. Um, to revitalize it, you have to revitalize bows too. Our office goes out to museums and private individuals and works with their permission to document Choctaw traditional art objects. So these are a number of bows that we've gone out and documented, Choctaw bows. There's not a direct archaeological correlate from pre-contact Choctaw sites, but obviously they had arrow points, so they had bows. And the arrow points appear in Choctaw country around 780. So bow making is a tradition that goes back 1300 years. To create a bow, obviously they had to have woodworking tools. This is a greenstone celt from the Lubbock Creek site. So let's make a salt. We start with greenstone, the same type that they had there. Um, first, you can flint nap it. We find flakes of greenstone in the archaeological record. The picture at the upper right shows what that same piece of stone looks like after it's been flint napped roughly. Then it's pecked. Basically, you take a sharp, fairly heavy piece of flint and you hit it against the axe preform at an oblique angle. And every time that you hit it, it removes a tiny, tiny pit. So that creates these hammer stones made out of flint with these rounded edges like you see at the bottom left there. You find those at a lot of archaeological sites. Oftentimes they're interpreted as flint napping hammer stones, but they very, very, may very well be hammer stones used for pecking a stone axe. The bottom right shows the next step in the sequence that's smoothing, grinding the axe on some abrasive material on top of a piece of sandstone. This is the end result of the salt blade research. You know, it looks almost just like the one that came from the archaeological site. It took 200,000 pecking blows, by the way, to shape this. So this is some really seriously hard stone. 
Much like an arrow, the salt blade is not much use on its own. You have to make a handle for it. This is an axe that comes from Choctaw country. It dates back more than a thousand years old. It was fished out of the Black Warrior River near Utah, Alabama. An absolutely incredible piece of preservation. But that shows us what the salt and the handle look like, which is usually perishable material. The salt is a beautiful piece of innovation. If we go back and you look at the salt blade, the original salt blade, is shaped like a wedge. So that's made to fit into a mortise and a handle. But it's only made to fit along its narrowest edges. So the two narrow edges of the stone touch the mortise, but the flat edges of the stone do not. If the flat edges did, it would create a wedge effect and it would split the handle apart because it's the narrow edges, the, the two lateral edges like this touching this handle, they don't split it apart because it's going against the wood grain. So it's difficult to make that type of precision cut in a piece of hardwood with stone tools. So we figured out this technique here and basically you take a, a piece of clay, make a coil out of it, and then use that to box in an area that you want to become the mortise. You put hot coals on it, you take a piece of cane and blow on it, you burn it through the handle, and then you use sandstone to do the fine shaping on that mortise so that it will touch the salt blade just in exactly the places it needs to and not elsewhere. This is the end result. These are a couple of salts that were used to cut down the bodark trees that you see back there. And of course, bodark's one of the hardest trees in the woods. It's about the ultimate test that you could have for a stone salt. And these work great. Um, you have to swing them a little bit harder than a metal axe, but if you do, you can get enormous chips of wood out of the hardest of trees. And that's what you see at the right there. Uh, it's interesting, as I was swinging these axes to cut the trees down, the steam was decompressing out of the wood, and it, it was just like this mist coming out of the wood. But the tools are quite effective. Switching over to another bow wood here, this is hickory. This is the process of splitting a hickory stave for a bow using a grooved hammer stone. This is the process of using an adz to do some of the rough shaping work. An adz is the same thing as a celt. It's just asymmetrical and it's put sideways in a handle like you see at the left there. The bow has to be rough shaped. And at the Lubbock Creek site, they were doing this with mussel shells. So this is a, a freshwater mussel shell broken in half and then it's being used to scrape the green wood. On the left side, that's a mussel shell from the Lubbock Creek site. And you can see that edge damage having been used as a scraper. On the right, that's a modern mussel shell having been used to tiller a bow. After the bow is 90% shaped, um, I should say all, all the, the woodworking is done while the wood's green. But after the bow is 90% shaped, you tie it down so that it can't warp and you allow it to dry. And then you do the, the fine tillering and fine adjustments, the fine wood removal with sharp flakes of stone. Um, just a bow by itself that's not useful. You have to have a string. Um, the, one of the best string materials is deer tendon. The tendon that comes from the legs is called hakshish in the Choctaw language. So this is a picture of the two tendons from the deer leg that are useful in making bow strings. Those are dried and shredded. This is the process of starting a bow string from deer tendon. There are other materials that were used traditionally too. Uh, this series of pictures shows how to make a bowstring from a red squirrel hide. Basically, you do a spiral cut so you can get as much length as you want, and then you twist the, the cut pieces together. Finished traditional bowstrings on the bottom. That one's made from deer sinew. The next one up is made from intestine. The next one is our squirrel rawhide. And then the top one's made from native plant fiber. They all have their own characteristics. So there's a finished bow made using the materials that we were just talking about. Bows and arrows have a lot of cultural meaning for Native American communities and Choctaws as well. Um, Choctaw has, for example, a traditional archery team. But I wanted to show a, something a little bit different in terms of results that this work has had that may have not been necessarily foreseen at the start. So on the left there, that's the great seal of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. That seal represents the tribe uh, on the tribal flag. It's at the tribal judicial building. You know, it's, it's on tribal letterhead. It's everywhere the Choctaw Nation is interacting with the public in an official way. 
And unfortunately, the bow and the arrows that were on the seal for the past 80 years were an English longbow and English arrows. You know, that's that's silly for Choctaw people who have a bow making tradition that goes back 1300 years to have another community's archery equipment on our seal. So through this research and through working with tribal leadership, we were able to create a new seal that has a Choctaw bow and Choctaw arrows on it. And that's what the tribe's been using for the past seven years or so. So you wouldn't think about archaeology or indigenous archaeology or cultural revitalization work necessarily having an impact on the tribal flag, but, but it has through producing new information and allowing people to make different decisions with that additional information. I've just hit the very basics of this, you know, bow and arrow making is some really advanced stuff. It has to be finely tuned. The arrows have to match each other. Um, these are some correlates of that found archaeologically at the Lubbock Creek site. These are arrow points that are clearly matched. These would have gone into a quiver traditionally. Most quivers would have been made out of deer hide. This is a deer hide tanned by a Choctaw man over 100 years ago. And, uh, you know, I could talk for days just about the process of traditional hide tanning, but I'm going to go through some of it here. This is skinning a deer with a flake of Tuscaloosa chert. It has to be skinned in just the right way. It's a real art form. The types of incisions that you make influence the final outline of the hide. The hide is naturally waterproof, so our ancestors learned that you can submit it to different chemicals to get rid of that waterproof aspect of it so that the hide tanning chemicals can penetrate. Wood ash is the way that my great grandfather did it. So that's what I'm doing here, coating the hide in wood ash. This causes the hide to swell up. So you can scrape off not just the hair, but the outer two most layers of the hide. On the left, that's Hakko Chubby. Uh, he's the one who tanned that hide I showed you earlier. He's scraping a deer hide. On the right is trying to do it in modern times, but using older tools. There aren't a whole lot of hide fleshing type scrapers, beamer type scrapers from the Choctaw archeological record. So we found that probably they were using a deer radius and ulna combination, which is what you see right below the main picture there. The hide has to be neutralized. Its pH has to be neutralized. So it's soaked in water for 24 hours. Then it's exposed to emulsified oils, things like egg yolks or brains that coat the hide fibers. In order for the hide to dry soft, it has to be stretched as it's drying. This is a process using ishtabithi that tool that looks like a stick there to push against the hide, stretch it as it's drying. The most common archeological feature at Choctaw sites in the Southeast are pits filled with burned corn cobs. Um, if you take some coals and put dry corn cobs on it inside a pit, it smokes, creates lots of smoke. This is useful for the hide. Uh, smoked hide has added protection against moisture and insects and it has a neat color. Once the hide's been smoked, it can be dyed different colors. And this is the, the finished piece here. You know, this is a whole weapon system. This is all made with stone tools from materials that come from the Choctaw homeland. So that's cool, but you know, it may not seem to have much meaning, but here a few years ago, Choctaw Nation made a Tushkahoma statue and that represents Choctaw culture. Um, it's at the Choctaw Capitol building where it's seen by 100,000 people every year. It's at the Choctaw Cultural Center and elsewhere too. And the bow and arrows and quiver that he has are, are the ones that were made with the stone tools that I just showed you. So lots and lots of people get to see that. It's, it's not something that's just in an archeological report. With the hide tanning, we've done hide tanning classes for community members. Um, the hides got used for making clothing for cultural center exhibits. The guy on the left there is wearing a buffalo robe. Yes, Choctaw people interacted with the buffalo back during the Pleistocene. And then with the population decline I was telling you about earlier in the 15, 1600s, there was no longer a limit on the population of bison in the east. There weren't enough native people to hunt them. So the bison population exploded eastward all the way to the Atlantic coast and the Florida peninsula. These are images of three individuals from near the Choctaw homeland that are wearing bison robes in the 1700s. We don't have a picture of a Choctaw bison robe, but you know they're, they're all over the landscape. If you look at this image here where you see the blue, that's Poa Atikfa. That means where the bison shed their hair in the Choctaw language. That's a name of a stream in Kemper County, Mississippi. The Choctaw people used to collect naturally shed bison wool, use a drop spindle to spin it into yarn, and then twine it into fabrics like you see here. This is the Choctaw textile group with a traditional Choctaw skirt that they've recreated from drop spindle spun bison wool. 
We have opportunities to interact with different partners. This is the Musée du Cai Branly in Paris. They have the largest collection of painted hides in the Eastern United States. Um, my wife and I raised bison. This is one of them. He was particularly bad at breaking fences uh, and he was butchering age, so we butchered him. And when we do this, we do it traditionally. Um, like I said, skinning is an art form. This is pulling it off so as not to put any cuts in the hide. Depending on the incisions that you make, it will create a finished hide with a particular shape. So in this case, we skinned it in such a way that the outline matched the outline of the hide that this guy's wearing here. Uh, this guy's wearing the hide upside down. In other words, the neck's going down. And in this picture, the hide and the frame's oriented the same way. It's got the same shape. Hide has to have the meat and fat removed. This is the process of using a cannon bone flesher to take those off. And you know, one of the one of the comments that I've come across in the traditional arts community is this right here. And it says, you read some of these reports and laugh at the conclusions drawn by the anthropologists, things they'd never say if they'd ever brain tanned even one hide. And so this is just a, a brief example here. On the left hand side, those are scrapers identified from the Love of Creek site. And if you ever actually use those on a hide, you would just shred it to pieces. Bison hide tanning is an art form, very complex. Um, the different parts of the hide have different characteristics. It has to be treated in different ways. I could do a whole presentation on this. On the left is a scraper from the Choctaw homeland. It's from the north part of Mobile Bay from the 1700s. In all probability, that was used to scrape a bison hide. It's made from glass. On the right hand side is a modern traditional scraper used to thin two bison hides. People may not realize it, but you know, bison hide can be three quarters of an inch thick. In order to tan it into a robe, you have to scrape away most of the thickness of the hide down to about two thicknesses of paper. So you're actually scraping away almost the entire hide in order to process it. Just possible interest here on the left hand side, that's what a scraped bison hide looks like with a metal scraper. On the right, that's with a stone scraper. You know, even with a very smooth edge, it puts those scores in the hide. Three parts of the process here. The top left is the fresh bison hide like you saw. The middle, that's it after it's been fleshed and dried. On the right, that's it after it's been taken down to the thickness of about two sheets of paper. Thinning the hide removes lots and lots of hide scrapings, which is what you see at the left here. Those hide scrapings can be rendered into hide glue, which is what you see at the right here. It's useful in arrow manufacture, which I talked about earlier. To tan a bison hide, you have to apply emulsified oils, just like a deer hide. In this case, these are brains being applied to the bison hide. It's stretched much like a deer hide as it's drying. The stretching opens up the fibers, so it turns it white, like you can see on the right here. The left side is yet to be stretched. It takes multiple applications of the tanning solution and multiple softening sessions. This is the same bison hide after a couple of after several applications of brains and after a couple of days of softening. At the end, as it starts to get soft, you pull it back and forth on a cable like this to get the action of the hide bending. It helps the epidermis to dry soft. And this is the result on the left. It's a squishy, soft brain tan bison hide. And you can still see the lines in it from the edges of the stone scraper. On the right hand side is the process of smoking the bison hide to protect it. And this is the finished product. Um, we've done two stone tool bison hides this summer. Great learning opportunity. And how, how does that relate to the community? You know, the knowledge that's come from the experience of doing those bison hides with the stone tools is something that we'll be sharing through cultural classes and things like that for years. Um, initially, we've got this blog post about it here to share it with the community. So all of these things interact, you know, it's not just isolated traditional arts, but all of these things interact with each other. And food, traditional food has so many different connections with Choctaw traditional culture. And I know I'm running short on time, but I'll present a little bit of that here. One key aspect of Choctaw traditional food is clay pottery. Um, these are two artifacts from the Lubbock Creek site. The one on the left is a piece of clay that a woman squeezed in her fist a thousand years ago. The house burned for whatever reason and it fired the clay. So today you can basically feel her hand in the clay. It's holding hands with a grandmother. On the right, that's a fingerprint underneath a pot jar that still has the nail impression and the ridges of the fingerprints. Archaeologists divide pottery in the Choctaw homeland into two classes. The Choctaw language does as well. Ampo, those are serving bowls. 
shoti, those are cooking pots. Archaeology shows us the way that they've developed through time in terms of style. We go out and we dig dozens of different clays from dozens of different sources in the Choctaw homeland. Uh, we process traditional tempers. This one's mussel shells that are being burned and pulverized to mix with the clay to keep it from cracking. On the left are shell-tempered globs of clay that were obviously stored in an ancestor's house at Lubbock Creek, and then the house burned and it fired the stored clay. On the right, those are globs of mussel shell-tempered clay from the Choctaw homeland in the present day. On the left is a broken piece of a cooking pot from the Lubbock Creek site. The arrows indicate coil marks, and I don't have a scale there, but that's a very wide coil. Cooking pots were traditionally made with wide coils, and then they were paddled. That's what shows going on in the right picture there. Broken piece of a cooking pot from the Lubbock Creek side on the left shows scraper marks after the pot's made and paddled and partially dried, then it's thinned down. That's what's going on in the picture at the right there using a mussel shell as a scraper. On the left shows the process for making a riveted jar handle. On the right shows that happening. This is the finished product. The, co the cooking pots were made differently from the serving vessels. The serving vessels, like you see here, were made with thin coils. And on the right, that's the base of a serving pot that has a mold mark on it. So this is the process for using a mold to shape the clay and then using coiling to make the neck of a bottle. Firing is an art form in itself. Um, I don't have time to go into the specifics. This is the process that we use here. You heat up the ground, you dry the ground out, you put broken shards of pottery on top of the hot ground. You fire the pots to a very, very narrow temperature window, just using your hands and eyes and experience as the temperature gauges. Through pottery revitalization efforts, we've taught hundreds of community classes in Choctaw Nation over the past 13 years, and students are becoming teachers. This is a way, one of many ways that culture has given back to archaeology. And the example here is the Shomotakali site from Kemper County, Mississippi. They encountered the feature that you see sort of at the middle of the picture there. And it's charcoal covered with broken pottery sherds and some more charcoal. They weren't really sure what that was, but that represents what's left when we do a traditional pottery fire. So we were able to take that and put it in an exhibit here so other people can see how the culture and the archaeology help each other. We have a program to revitalize seeds. You can't make traditional food just with pottery alone. So this program has gone out, collected Choctaw heritage seeds, works to grow them out and to keep them from going extinct and to share them with community members that want to grow them and produce traditional foods. Traditional foods touch with many different aspects of culture. River cane basketry is one of them. The tribe's working to revitalize that with help from the Mississippi Band of Choctaws. Mortar and pestle, another essential cooking item. This is making one by burning it out, kind of like you saw with the salt handle earlier. Also have to have spoons. On the left, it's a bison horn spoon and a shell spoon from Lubbock Creek. On the right, it's a bison horn spoon made recently. And you combine these together and this is what you get. This is grinding corn in a wooden mortar and pestle and then sifting it to size through a basket. You can take that sifted corn, set it aside, take a cooking pot, put some fruit in it, some water, boil it, take that boiling fruit juice, put it back in the mortar and pestle, mix it together, make these dumplings, put those back in the pot, boil them, and you get this Wallachie, a traditional Choctaw fruit dish. I'm going to just go through some different pictures of Choctaw traditional foods here. I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, this was interesting. There aren't a whole lot of stone knives in Choctaw country. So actually, you can use river cane to fillet meat in this way for jerky. This is ayabani. It's a grill for cooking meat. It's the same that was used in the Caribbean where they called it barbacoa. That's where the English word barbecue comes from, this type of cooking apparatus. Stone boiling in a fiber tempered pot. The little holes left from the fiber insulate the walls so it's really efficient to cook from the inside out. Um, lamb squirter seeds and a little bit later style pottery. Moundville pottery with sassafras root. Traditional squash dish. This is a griddle that was found archaeologically at Lubbock Creek. This is using a similar griddle to fry corn pones and bear grease. Yeah, that's really bear grease. Other interesting uses for pottery, this is a Choctaw traditional bread recipe where the bread's cooked on hot clay underneath an inverted pot. 
burning pea pods to make hitok, a traditional spice. This is a traditional Choctaw dish called um, tafola that's made with that spice. Bison horn spoon, clay bowl from the Choctaw homeland. Parching corn gives Wallachia a different flavor. Some of these things would create interesting features, interesting correlates archaeologically. So you see how the traditional arts combine with each other. You know, they also combine with Choctaw language, they combine with well-being, but they also combine with the land. So the most ambitious work that we're doing is to revitalize relationships with the landscape as a whole and community. Um, the information that, that we gain from this collaboration between archaeology and traditional cultures shared through a variety of ways. Itifa Basa is a monthly column that we do in the tribal newspaper. Uh, we've set up Hina Hanta. It's a traditional arts database where community members or anyone can go see what Choctaw traditional art objects look like that are housed in our own institutions and also around the country. We have put together uh, a YouTube page that has 150 accurate Choctaw cultural videos, Choctaw food book, and of course the cultural center. And I think I've run over a couple minutes, but hopefully we still have time for questions. So let's see what we've got. And I do see a few questions. You may be able to see them under the published tab. Um, but the first question we received was from, uh, asks, what were the lengths of the bows that you showed in your presentation? So the links are a little bit variable. There are Choctaw bows that are used for hunting small game, you know, rabbits and that kind of thing. And they tend to be like in the 50 inch range. They're not intended for a very long draw. They're not intended to be very powerful. Then there are Choctaw bows that are used for hunting large game or for war. And those are just almost as tall as the archer. So, you know, some of those can be approaching six feet in length. We also had a question asking if there was a site discussing the elements of the Choctaw seal. And uh, we received a, a response to that question also from with a website uh, from ChoctawNation.com. Uh, those are the questions that we received from folks who are, who are watching. I was wondering um, if you, uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter and I attended Indigenous Archaeology Day at the Cultural Center last year. Um, and you're having that event again this year, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And I can find the date for you here. Excellent. Well, maybe, maybe I could just send it out and, you know, it'll probably take me a couple minutes to find it. That's, that's fine. I think it might be October 14th that uh, based right. on the website. And uh, I just would encourage anyone who's interested in, uh, in making that trip. Uh, it was a wonderful experience and you have a beautiful cultural center. It's really incredible. And Kim Hinson did confirm that that date is October 14th. Yeah, Kim Kim leads that event. She does a really good job. Last year we had some students from OU and yourself from the SHPO and a bunch of people. It was a good time. So please come on by. You'll see traditional arts demonstrated, but you'll also have opportunities to do archaeology activities and interact with archaeological staff from Choctaw Nation. We do have some additional questions. Let's see. We have uh do you intentionally select temper for cooking versus serving vessels? And do you find one type or size gradient more resistant to thermal stress from cooking and reheating? Yes, absolutely. So I've got a particular sifter basket that I use, which you saw in some of the pictures, I was sifting corn with it at the time, but I also use that for pottery temper. And I'll use that particular sifter basket for making temper for cooking pots. And it has pretty large mesh size in it, you know, like, I don't know, maybe quarter of an inch. So pretty large pieces of shell fall through that. Those larger pieces of shell protect the pot from thermal stress. They're not so great for protecting it from mechanical stress. So for the cooking pots, it's got big pieces of temper in it. For the serving vessels, it's got very fine pieces of temper in it. The finer temper also allows you to polish the serving vessels, which was commonly done. Additionally, you know, some of the pottery in the Choctaw homeland, it's got so much shell in it, particularly the cooking pots. Some of them are actually more shell than clay. 
So if you can find a really, really sticky clay that will take just gobs of shell without losing its workability, that will make a very durable cooking pot. Let's see. Um, we have another question asking about a source for learning about uh, pre-colonial spiritual tattoo or traditions. Sorry, if there is a source. A lot of that is, you know, sort of proprietary knowledge of Choctaw traditionalists and that type of thing. Um, our office has done a few basic articles on it in the Biskinic, and there is. Um, an archive of those articles at ChoctawNationCulture.com if you'd like to look at them. Um, there are a lot of aspects that, like Choctaw traditional religion isn't really a public facing religion. So there are a lot of aspects of that that aren't in those articles, but you can get some basic idea about the green corn ceremony and about some of the different spiritual entities that are part of Choctaw traditional religion. So that looks like all the questions that we have at this time. Uh, I see one more. Oh, um, no. Thank you. Are the archaeological sites mentioned still active? So most of the work that I was talking about is from archaeological sites that were destroyed. That's the reason that they were excavated. The Lubbock Creek site was destroyed by a cutoff made in the Tom Bigby River back in the early 1980s. So that site does not exist anymore. Shomo Takali in Kemper County, Mississippi was to become part of a massive coal mine. So the whole site was gonna be excavated 50 feet below surface. However, that mine didn't materialize. So that site is still there. Thank you so much, Ian. Really appreciate your presentation. This was wonderful information. And uh, we, I hope that you may be willing to share more with us in the future. I know you guys are up to a lot of things. So thank you very much for, be, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity.